Morning, everybody. Morning. Um, can everybody hear me? Can you guys hear me at the back? Yes. Can you see? Um, it's, I, I was standing at the back and I couldn't really see. Is there a way we can potentially switch the top lights off? Or? Okay, cool, cool. Um, guys, thanks a lot, uh, and especially Ashley, for inviting me back uh, after last year's talk. Um, I don't know, I think, just a show of hands, who, was, who attended last year's WordCamp? Okay, so quite a few of you. Um, who saw my talk in the morning, the, the Grateful Dead? Okay, so a few of you. I did a talk um, last year on, uh, on building community. It's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, and I used the Grateful Dead as, as a kind of case study. And I went through a whole bunch of steps that are really important, things that we have seen, or I, my company has seen uh, in the process of the work that we do, uh, the sort of commonalities in, in community building. And, and I want to, this, this talk is pretty much when uh, Ashley asked me to come back and, and unpack it a bit more, um, this is pretty much like a sequel to last year's talk. So, so here goes. I just wanted to start by telling a quick story, something that I thought was pretty interesting. It's, um, it's about uh, this, this particular dude over there. Um, his name is Hernan Cortez. And uh, despite being quite a snappy dresser, he, um, he happened to be quite a cruel and, uh, and uh, remarkable man. He, um, he was a Spanish conquistador in the 1500s. And basically, him and his merry bunch of men came into South America. And, uh, and he approached um, what, basically the, what is now Mexico City. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a very spectacular place called uh, Tenochtitlan. I don't know if I got that, that right. But it was ruled by a guy called Montezuma II. And Montezuma had been this, this kind of deity king overseeing <laughs> Um, his, uh, his, his population of about 250,000 people um, in a very cruel fashion. If anyone's seen Apocalypto, you kind of get the idea of what they're all about. So Hernan Cortes came to, uh, to these guys. They were the Aztecs. And um, the Aztecs. And he, he basically struck a deal with them. His deal was something similar to the following. He said, okay, Montezuma, um, I'm going to kill you unless you give me your gold. Um, so Montezuma thinking, shit, maybe I should believe this guy. He's got this really big army behind him, and we've got a whole bunch of gold. So let me hand over my gold. So Hernan Cortes promptly chopped his head off after he'd handed over the gold, it surrounded the city, um, the, you know, this uh, Titlian, and, and starved the 250,000 people uh, over the, the course of the next three months. So within Two years of Hernan Cortes arriving in uh, South America, he basically obliterated an entire civil civilization of people that had been living for centuries before then and, and organized this, this whole community of people. Um, about 10 years later, another conquistador guy called Francisco Pizarro went to the Incas and did exactly the same thing. He made a deal, said, look, give me your gold or I'm going to kill you. And he then killed them anyway. Within two years, the Incas were gone. So in the space of two decades, these brilliant uh, organizations that had been developed over centuries were just gone. So about 150 years later, uh, the Spaniards had basically been taken over pretty much the whole of South America and Central America. And they eventually started traipsing a little bit further north. And they. Um, they encountered these happy-looking gentlemen um, who were called the Apaches, the Apache Indians. Now, a lot of you will probably know the name of... Uh, I'm, going to, I'm just going to continue. Um, we'll know the name Geronimo. Uh, Geronimo was possibly the most famous Apache Indian of all time. But he wasn't the only leader there. They had, the Apaches were very disparate. Uh, group of people. They were spread across, um, 
you know, spread across the, the sort of New Mexico area in, uh, in the, what's now the United States. And um, a remarkable thing happened because the Spanish, who'd been so used to bulldozing through the areas, encountered these guys who happened to be quite a peace-loving um, group of people who were very interested in nature and they, they enjoyed their freedom and they were, you know, they were, they'd never really had many natural enemies. Um, an extraordinary thing happened. The Spanish, when doing the deal with them, saying, look, you know, you either succumb to us, to our leadership, convert to Christianity, or we're going to kill you. And the Apaches said, no, that doesn't sound like a great deal to us. So they chopped off the head of the leader that was in front of them. And another leader popped up, and another leader, and another leader. They kept on killing these guys. And the Spanish lost. They actually had to retreat. Over the course of the next two decades, the Spanish beat a retreat south, back to where they'd come from. The Apaches won. And um, they tried again a couple of decades later, and they lost again. And over the next 300 years, the Apaches were never defeated. They eventually became a little bit irrelevant in the turn of the, the 19th century. Which brings me to my next story, which is, and I'll get back to the Apaches a little bit later. The turn of the 19th century basically saw the Industrial Revolution, which saw, um, I don't know, the back, you probably can't see this, but this is one of the first motorbikes. Um, that was, uh, this is in the year 1901. And, and it was an extraordinary time to live, not too dissimilar to what we're going through right now, but there was a lot of change happening. A lot of uh, manufacturing processes, industry was booming, everything was, was happening, a lot of innovation in tech, um, and a lot of entrepreneurs were making a hell of a lot of money. And the motorcycle in industry was really interesting because at that stage, there were over, in the, in the first two decades of the 19th century, there were over 100 motorcycle brands in the United States alone. Um, those brands include names like Ace, Cleveland, Crocker, Cushman, Flying Merkel, Flanders, the, um, the Yickel, the, the Sears, Thor, Whizzer, and hundreds of others. Um, one of the most significant ones was this brand, which is the Indian. Some of you motorcycle fanatics might recognize the name Indian, but they're now defunct. But back in the day, from the first, uh, the turn of the century to about 1950, these guys were the market leaders. That nobody could touch them. They had the best bikes, the best manufacturing. They had these massive big factories which spanned acres and acres. And they were pumping out tens of thousands of bikes a year. And they were making billions. And they were doing really, really well. Um, so I've got a question. Out of those hundred brands that basically were the turn of the centuries, um, how many of those brands are still around today in the United States? Anybody? One. Only one. Um, and obviously, it's Harley Davidson. And Harley Davidson has not only survived, but they've thrived. And similarly to the Apaches, they faced significant opposition. The opposition of the Apaches was possibly the most organized uh, fighting force that America had ever seen. I mean, they, have, they were better equipped, they had better weapons, they, were, they had you know, better training, they were, they were really, really well regimented, they had all these power structures in place, and they were used to winning. As anyone who watches rugby, you can see the pattern emerge when a team starts to win all the time. But yet, um, the Apaches defeated them. Now, Holly Davidson no, had no less significant opposition with, uh, with the Indian brand. And this brand that everybody rated was a better bike. Everybody thought the Indian was going to be you know, around for the next you know, two, 200 years. And, um, and yet, in about 1960, they closed their doors. Holly Davidson, despite all this opposition, survived and thrived, as, as anyone who rides bikes um, uh, today know. And so what is the common thread between these two communities, the Holly Davidson and the Apaches? Um, and and what, is the, you know, what is this thing that ties them together? Um, and for me, it's basically boiling down to what I want to talk to, to you about today, which is, which is leading on from last year's talk, which is 
both communities had a resonant and visceral cause. And, um, and this thing of cause, I just want to try and unpack today. It's a really tricky uh, topic, so I'm going to do my best. But um, just so that you know, this title, by the way, uh, Midgets on Unicycles, Steve Hoffman, Elvis Presley, and Table View, a little disclaimer was, Ashley phoned me up and he was like, what's the name of your talk? I need to put it on the website. I was like, I don't know. Let's just call it this. So there's not really a hell of a lot of <laughs> meaning towards it. So just a, a quick introduction um, to me. Um, my name is Fred Rode. I'm the CEO of a digital marketing agency called Worldwide Creative. And um, we have a number of clients in South Africa. We've got an office in Johannesburg, an office in Cape Town. We have an office in London. We've got some beautiful work. And basically, our story is that we want to become the best in the world at creating profitable online communities. Something we're deeply passionate about, something I personally am really, really passionate about. And I try to unpack and think about um, you, you know, what the dynamics and, and I spend an inordinate amount of time just trying to figure out communities. Um, some of you may know me from uh, the Heavy Chef Project, which is why we have all these, these uh, sort of cooking analogies uh, in our brand identity. Um, I encourage you guys to go and check out heavychef.com. It includes a lot of the interviews that we do with so-called heavy chefs or thought leaders in our, in our industry. Um, and, and it is, over the course of the work that we do, it has occurred to me that this idea of cause within community is, uh, is really, really important. So I want to I go into the, the reasons why I think that. Um, the noise is increasing. I think this is obvious to everybody here today. I think we all know that social media over the past seven or eight years has really, or so, certainly social networking, has you know, created publishers of all of you. And so we're just pumping out information all, all the time. Um, just yesterday, uh, Worldwide Works, which is a, um, a very well-known uh, research company in South Africa led by a guy called Arthur Goldstack, uh, he released his, um, his social media report for 2012. And there were some interesting findings. I mean, essentially what's happening now is uh, in a study of the big brands in South Africa, 95% of, of brands in South Africa use social media. Um, I don't know what the hell those other 5% are thinking, but the um, one in five corporates outsource, outsource their, uh, corp uh, their social media, which is quite interesting because how do you tap into the you know, the, the, the cause of a, of a company if you're a 20-year-old intern sitting in an agency un, you know, unrelated to, to the actual the brand that you're working for. Um, from a WordPress and a blogging social media perspective, there are 55 million uh, WordPress blogs according to WordPress stats page. And um, they were saying that 500,000 new posts, 400,000 new comments posted every day. Um, in South Africa, I thought this was quite interesting out of the social media report yesterday, that 80% of South Africa's brands value basically what this is saying. They value the quantity over the quality. So they're not that interested in sentiment. They don't really care what they think as long as there are people there, which I thought was quite interesting, again, from this, you know, the idea of cause and community. Um, and then, of course, Facebook is just this unstoppable machine. Um, there's, when we're closing in on a, on a billion uh, Facebook users, uh, there's 350 million people using Facebook on their phones. Um, Twitter's another animal. I mean, I think there's now 250 million tweets per day. Uh, that was at the end of last year, that stat, so I don't know what it is now, but there's... Um, I mean, you know, it spikes at, at about 9,000 tweets per second um, at, certain, at certain times and certain events. Um, and Lady Gaga has 18 million followers on Twitter, so go figure. Um, I think another important thing is, is that, I mean, this is quite revealing to me, this whole thing of trust and, and the various channels that are available to us now. As a marketer, it's quite challenging because you have all these different channels and which ones are more effective and which ones aren't. And as per, you know, 2,000 years ago, word of mouth is still the same, still the most powerful form of marketing. Um, we just have a better vehicle to channel word of mouth now through social media and the peer recommendations that we, we, we have through our social networks. 
Um, but the point is that with all this noise, community building is really important. It's important for us to have a community of, of passionate fans around us. And um, as I said last year in, um, in the Grateful Dead talk, you know, it's, it is about sharing. I mean, the word community came from uh, the Latin word communitas, which means to share. And what we've seen at Worldwide Creative is there's this kind of pattern that emerges in the work that we do with communities, um, where in every marketing, in every social media campaign, every digital marketing campaign, there's, there's three uh, what we call horizontals, which are attracting traffic, converting traffic, and the retention of traffic. It's pretty much the sort of cycle of a, of a campaign. And um, the, the horizontals, and I think really, really important, and possibly one of the most important topics uh, that you guys should be thinking about is you know, content syndication, this idea of content marketing, creating content that's valuable to your community. It's really, really important to building a community and attracting and, and converting and retaining. Um, strategic engagement, so using the tools to be able to listen uh, and engage when necessary. Uh, tools like online reputation management tools and you know, client uh, interfaces like TweetDeck and so on. Um, as well as, I think, with all this noise, possibly the most important is this idea of, um, of creative stimulus. So thinking creatively and innovatively about packaging the, the messages that you, you convey. But at the middle of all of this is cause, because no community is sustainable without a cause. And I, I want to talk about that a little bit. What is a cause? A cause, in my eyes and the way I see it, is something that evokes this visceral reaction. It's something that you want to fight for. You know, um, the, um, the, 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 the dog representative who, who was just up here was talking about the fact that she'd been there for 17 years. Um, you know, there's a cause there. There's a real resonant cause, and it has this visceral reaction. V visceral means something that you kind of feel in your tummy. It's something that you really kind of feel for, and it's not easy. Another disclaimer is that um, I don't think a cause is for everybody. We work with a, a very uh, well-known uh, legal firm, <laughs> and sitting around that table with all these, you know, odious, verkrampt lawyers who've been around for the last 30 years and saying to them, what's your cause? They're like, I don't know, we just want to make cuck loads of money, you know? <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe that is a cause. But the point is that what I'm trying to say is that cause is, is quite special, if you can figure it out. Um, so let's look at some organizations that have actually done this successfully. Um, and one obvious one that springs to mind is Apple. I mean, what is Apple's cause, if you think about it? Apple's cause, in my eyes, is about beautiful, functional technology. And they've been quite consistent about that over time, even in the early days. They really wanted to make this. They, certainly Steve Jobs really paid so much attention to industrial design. Um, but it's this combination of aesthetics and function that make Apple special. And I think people res it resonates with people. You know, it, it makes you feel better about yourself when you use their, their equipment. Ferrari is, you know, it's, it's another survivor uh, through bad and, and, and good times. Their cause is all about this, this really kind of sexy performance. And, um, and it resonates with, with fans across the globe. Vespa, I mean, Vespa, again, you know, similarly to, to Harley Davidson, is just a survivor, you know, from the, from the days it starts, it's faced fierce competition, yet it has this kind of anti-establishment um, uh, bohemian cause, which is really cool, and people love their Vespas. They're willing to pay five, sometimes eight times more for their, their Vespa than they are for a pretty comparable machine. Why would they do that? Just for this little little brand, and I think it's more than a mark on a on a vehicle. I think it's it's that cause. Um, one of our clients, Virgin, that we work a hell of a lot with, and we're really trying to unpack it. It's it's a fascinating cause because they've got so many different companies around the world that are totally unrelated to each other, but they are linked by this one simple cause, which is the little guy taking on the big guy. It's this cocky iconoclastic little dude who's going to take on, you know, Vodacom from a, 
a, a mobile telephony perspective, or the banks uh, from a money perspective, or British Airways, you know, the behemoth of, of the skies, they took them on and they won in many respects um, through Virgin Atlantic. Uh, Wikipedia is a great example of a completely disparate bunch of individuals all working together behind a cause. And as a result, it's practically unstoppable. I mean, who could imagine a world without Wiki Wikipedia? And these guys are going to be a survivor just because, well, if you think about it, think about taking Wikipedia away. I mean, there would be this massive outcry, and the cause is strong behind them. So I saw these guys on TV a couple of weeks ago, and then I saw them again on the news, and then I saw them again in a, in a magazine. It's a, it's a community called Leashes and Lovers. And it's essentially started by this, this lady in New York. Uh, her name's Shelley, and she, um, she loves her dog. She's a bit odd. She's really, really kind of passionate about her dog. And so she realized that she was quite a lonely person. And, um, and so she started this community and realized that a lot of other people really, really love their dogs as well. And it just kind of grew out of this simple cause, this, this complete passionate just joy of being around their, their canine friends. And this organization has organically grown out of that community, and it's an extremely profitable one. They now have a book, they have a full-blown, um, they've got a dating site uh, where dog owners can get together for these events. Um, their website just, I mean, it's got a whole lot of really strange stuff on going on, in it, but, but it's awesome. I mean, when I saw them on TV, these guys absolutely loved it, and they're growing fast. Um, you know, there's, in the northern suburbs, there's a group of guys who get together dressing like Elvis. Um, I think it's once every two months. And although they're not a very big group, they, um, they're part of a much huger community. Take Graceland. They have millions of visitors, or sorry, hundreds of thousands of visitors every year to Graceland. They make this, this pilgrimage to the home of the king. Why? Um, on a more sinister note, I mean, this guy was a complete cuck, but he <laughs> somehow managed to, to create this community in a very, very unstable time. If you consider that when he came to power, it was just at the time of the biggest worldwide recession that anybody had ever seen and has seen subsequently. Um, and he somehow managed to pull this country in ruins behind him. And how did he do it? He gave them a very, very simple cause. He, his cause, in, 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 in his words, was this idea of this Aryan race. And he created this common enemy, which was uh, the Jewish race. And it was something that somehow people understood. And a very revealing conversation was recorded between him and um, Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, where he said, if, they were, if, they, if it weren't for the Jews, I would create something else. I would create another enemy out of nothing because people need that. They need to fight for something, and they need to fight against something. So that was quite revealing in terms of, um, of the power of this thing. So similarly, we have Steve Hoffman. So you can mock this guy, this handsome fella, who's, who's got kids all over South Africa. Um, he, that's how he's creating a community. So his, the thing about Steve Hoffman actually is quite interesting because he's organically creating this community around his kind of you know, he's fighting for his heritage, or so he says he does. I don't know how successful he is, or he will be, but, but he's, he's doing something similarly along those lines. So, just getting to the, the last parts of this talk is, why is this idea of cause so important? And I came up with a couple of things, just off the top of my head. And firstly, a cause is profitable. So you look at... Um, you look at a lot of those companies that we spoke about, Apple in particular, they're on the verge of becoming a trillion dollar company, the first ever. Their market cap is unheard of. Um, the iPhone, which is not too different to the iPhone 4, the iPhone 5 is now selling, you know, at a faster lick than any other consumer product in history. And they've got this 
this community of, of people just, um, just absolutely rabidly passionate around this cause of functional, beautiful technology. The second is that a cause is compelling. And you can see that when some, it's like that thing of Johnny Walker, you know, man, the world steps aside for a man who knows where he's, where he's going. And I think that's true of an organization with a cause. People look at them and there's something compelling with a, about an organization that has a really clearly defined cause. They know what to believe in and they know what they, they're doing. Um, I saw... Uh, an interview with Rudy Giuliani. I don't know if anyone knows who he is or remembers him. He was the mayor of New York during the 9-11 disaster. And um, he, um, a few, uh, I think two years afterwards, a bunch of MBA students asked him the question, what is your greatest leadership lesson? I mean, he showed real, uh, he was, you know, that he was a really adept leader and he was, he was great during that time. And he said in answer to the question that you've got to know what you believe in because it helps you through bad times and good to make the right decisions. And that's the, that's the thing about cause. It helps you to make right decisions because it's a stake in the ground. It's something to measure the decisions about and helps you to be clear. How many of you are entrepreneurs? Okay. So you know as much as I do how muddy sometimes the, the, the decisions you have to, to make can get. There's so much emotion involved. There's you know, there's so many variables. And a cause helps you through that. And I think that's, that's quite valuable. A cause polarizes people. I mean, just look at organized religion. You know, but at the same time, it also connects people in that visceral way that I spoke about. And that's as important. Um, a cause is sustainable. And you look at Harley Davidson, for example. You know, the amount of... Uh, of pressure that Harley Davidson has been under over 100 years. You look at the onslaught from the Japanese brands, Honda, Suzuki, Kawasaki, and all that. They managed to weather that storm um, and sustain their success and affinity towards their brand because of that cause. Um, I mean, Harley Davidson, their cause is not about the engineering or the motorbikes. My brother is a motorbike mechanic, um, and he says Harley Davidson bikes are crap, in his opinion. He's a huge Kawasaki fan. And, and despite their inferior engineering, or so-called inferior engineering, they have a much more passionate audience than any of the other the, the motorcycle brands. And, and that's how they weathered the storm. I mean, they were almost bankrupt three times in their 100-year in their history. Um, and a cause makes life meaningful. I think that's also very important. Um, it, you can see it with people who do follow a cause. You know, they will, they, they will do pretty much anything for that cause. In some case, you know, in, in religion's case, they'll die for that cause. A cause is cost effective. Um, you know, you just look at people who will often work for free to, to get behind a, a cause. Um, a great example with Harley Davidson is that in the 1997 Super Bowl, um, you guys know the Super Bowl is, it's, it's the sort of grand finale of uh, the American football season where, you know, the two finalists clash against each other, not unlike our Curry Cup final or whatever, you know. And, um, and to get an advert, a 30-second spot for a, a company to advertise at halftime at the Super Bowl costs in the millions of dollars. It's, it's one of the most coveted spots in advertising. Yet, in the 1997 um, Super Bowl, they offered Harley Davidson the opportunity to have 100 motor motorcycles on the pitch for free because they wanted to you know, capture some of that, that cool essence of, of Harley Davidson. And that kind of thing happens to Harley Davidson all the time. Um, we, do, well, we did quite a lot of work for Ferrari. And I just remember chatting to, uh, to the marketing manager of, of Ferrari South Africa. And he was just amazed by every single week they were offered free advertising just because they wanted Ferrari's brands. Full page spreads, double page spreads, big, you know, 100,000 rand uh, advertising spots for free because they wanted that, um, you know, to, to bask in that, that brand's cause. Um, so it's cost effective. It's not all good, though, because there's, 
there's this definition that I've been thinking about, good cause versus bad cause. And last year we spoke about the Grateful Dead. The Dead Heads, the Grateful Dead's cause is a great one. It's sustainable because over the course of time, you know, it's allowed the Grateful Dead, even two decades after their demise, they are now more profitable than ever because of the, the Dead Heads' absolute rabid passion around their music. The Grateful Dead's cause was the sheer love of music, this, this natural beauty of music. And they were true to that all the time. They never sold out. Um, then compare that to, <laughs> to the modern day equivalent, the, the, the believers. Um, so that's not a great cause because I don't think it's sustainable, to be quite honest. I don't think this dude is, is going to be able to sustain this kind of uh, you know, fandom for a long period of time. I mean, he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna go through puberty at some point and have pimples. And... <laughs> but the point is, you know, in a decade from now, it, you know, because it's so commercial, I don't think it'll, that's not a cause. Their cause is him, Justin Bieber. Whereas the Grateful Dead's cause was about the music. It was bigger than the band themselves. Um, the Arab Spring. I think is a great example of a cause. I mean, this is now a women's organization um, that, were, that were arguing against the, you know, the despotic, autocratic rule in Libya. And you, you've got these, these examples throughout uh, last year of, of this kind of um, uprising behind that, that similar cause. Whereas in antithesis, you've got the, um, the labor unions in South Africa. Um, and I mean, you know, whatever the complications of that situation is, it's not sustainable to keep on fighting for increasing wages uh, at the cost of the company itself. You're biting the hand that feeds. So that's a bad cause. It's not, a, it's, it's not sustainable. Um, one of our clients is, a, is Jay Naidu, the, um, the anti-apartheid uh, legend, one of the greatest guys that I've met in my life. And he, he often says to me, paraphrases Gandhi, by saying, um, follow the cause, not the man. And I think that's very true. So that's good cause versus bad cause. And so finally, just what should you do? Um, or why should you focus on building a community? And it's the same reasoning that I gave last year. Um, people who are within a community are nine times more likely to buy that community's product than a competitor's product. It's a, it's a financial decision as much as a, a visceral decision. I think the visceral decision needs to come first and you need to figure it out. And trust me, I know that it's not easy. You can't always have a cause. It sometimes just doesn't fit. But, but it does help, um, and, it, and it's certainly proven. $10,000 invested in Harley Davidson in the early 80s is now worth, I think, about $400,000. So, um, and you look at, for example, Apple iPhone versus the Samsung Galaxy S3. I've spoken to a couple of guys. They rate, they rate the, the Galaxy is a much better phone, but it can't touch the Apple for, uh, for sales. So I just want to encourage you guys, just in closing, just to think about this question. And I know it's a, it's a deep one, and to be quite honest, I'm still unpacking it myself. Um, but in a, in a hundred years from now, I do believe that people will be looking back on this particular little pocket of history and looking at it in the same way that we look back on, on uh, the Industrial Revolution 100 years ago. This is an extraordinary time to live. We have got access to tools that are just absolutely unheard of in terms of connecting people. So with all of this going on, it can be quite overwhelming. But with a cause, with a resonant and visceral cause, it's going to make a big difference to your lives and your business. Thanks very much. <laughs>